Hi, everybody. I thought a lot about what to do at this conference, given um, all the topics that you'll hear. And what I thought I would do is um, try to take you back in time um, and give you a sneak peek of um, what happens inside Apple, what happened inside Apple, um, and how these innovation cycles work. Because um, as we all know, we usually are on the outside uh, trying to figure out, for example, when will the Apple Watch be launched and what it will do. Um, so the topic I'm going to uh, speak about today is really about um, what happens on top of devices, things, mobile, um, tablets, and uh, all types of products. Um, and uh, I chose this topic because um, as the devices proliferate, ultimately the use for us as people and human beings uh, comes from what we do on top of it. So uh, as you will know from both this presentation and my history, I've spent my entire life really focused on uh, what people want to do with these things, which in you know, technical terms we would say is the application layers. Uh, and today I hope to give you some idea of uh, while a lot is changing in the device world, uh, it's the usages of it which will be so interesting and exciting, which I titled today as the emotion and the science of content, um, which is what's happening on top of these devices. So um, I look at the world in three different major changes that have happened. Um, you think about printing and what it changed in the world because you could actually mass manufacture uh, books and then magazines and spread them. Uh, and completely changed the way we live. Uh, if you fast, fast forward to TV and cable, depending on the country, one happened before the other, or Sky, and, and the impact that made to the industry as a whole and then to us as consumers, I, I think the single, what I call the you know, three-part effect that we're living through right now is the birth of the internet, which I would call Web 1.0, the start of social, which was called Web 2.0, and the actual start of mobile devices, which I would start to call Internet 3.0. Um, so how did these things happen? Um, I'd like to take a step back and take you with me on a journey. Um, imagine it's 1980s, and these slides don't exist, um, what the world looked like uh, while we were inside Apple. So, this is the work that we were doing um, around the time, uh, probably past 1986. And in 86 was really two big things happened. Um, color became commonplace at the beginning of personal computers. And number two, desktop publishing uh, started as a revolution. Um, during that time, there was a group inside Apple really focused on envisioning uh, three things at the same time. Number one, what the physical devices will look like, which was a very important uh, future thing that needed to happen to understand, you know, remember the mouse was only two years old to most people at that time. There wasn't even a trackpad yet. Um, and there was this very deep belief that we would want personal devices that we would hold, and we hired many firms to help us envision what actually the hardware of this would look like. And, um, I can tell you there's no question you can ask 25 years ago to which the answer is human beings want to swipe things. You can ask a lot of questions. So at Apple, the key learning, if there's one thing from today's keynote you can take away, it's very easy to understand and anticipate people's needs. It's very hard to, to understand and anticipate people's unstated needs. Because if you ask people what they want, they generally will not tell you what to invent. They'll tell you what they want based on what they know, which is magazines or TV or books or today, you know, uh, cell phones. They won't tell you what they need. You have to figure out through intuition and through design and understanding what people might need. So this era, which was what I call 1986 
to about early 90s was very important. Uh, we created a video called Knowledge Navigator. Many of you have seen it. If you haven't, go look at it at YouTube. It's an incredible example of the roots of where we are today and what changed. Um, but something happened around the end of this era that changed both Apple and our worlds forever, and that's in the next slide. Uh, given this is a founders conference, what I wanted to really bring up was how are founder innovation cycles fundamentally different than non-founder or corporate? And this is a slide that I created. It's not from the web. I'm going to walk you through it to tell you how big decisions are made by founders and what that leads to. So on the left, you see at the bottom is the Knowledge Navigator. It's a prototype, never existed, was really created for a video. Okay? Um, next to it is Apple's first tablet. It was called PenMac. It's 1989. It was a device that was built by the hardware team using the most current Mac OS. Uh, Paul Mercer, who's on the picture next to it, um, was, had just come back from Japan, was very influenced by Casio and many devices. On that device, he actually created a micro operating system, the first mobile operating system, really in the existence of the world. And my team with me started to build navigation applications uh, on top of it. So just imagine in 1989, trying to build applications when no apps existed, no mobile apps existed, and create a framework for developers to create apps on a device that Apple was building. Um, simultaneously, Steve was working on a device on top, um, Sackerman, called, which became Newton. So, and that started a world of PDAs, as you know. And John had to make a decision between John Scully, after Steve left, between Newton or PenMac. Normally, if I was CEO, I would have made the decision of these are two separate product lines and leave them. But in this decision, what was made was that we will stick with Newton and shut down the Pen Mac or Apple tablet project. And the rest, as they say, is history. As you know, the Newton came out. It was way ahead of time. I see some of you people using devices that look suspiciously like the Newton, like the gentleman in the corner over here. So it didn't all go away. Um, but what happened to Apple Tablet is fascinating history, and this is how innovation cycles work. Paul went out to create a company called Pixel. I went off to create a company that became Ray, then NetObjects, continued working on information navigation devices, for, uh, uh, applications for all devices. Um, Paul then ended up at Samsung, so think about the history of how this is entwined. Um, Steve Jobs comes back to Apple, and the first decision he makes is to relicense the Pen Mac code from Pixel and use it to build a small device no one had heard of called iPod. So today, if you actually think about the history, Pixel is the largest operating system for a smartphone ever created uh, in the total numbers. And everything that happened during that era led now to the Apple Watch and also to Siri. This is remarkable if you think about the innovation cycle. Agreed? Now, even though Newton did not survive, there was one invention that happened in Newton that completely changed our world, and that was the, f the ARM chip. So think about though the software and the idea did not work. As we all know, today's devices have been completely transformed by the creation of, by demand by Apple, of this little chip, very low heat, called ARM, that is in almost every Apple device that you use. So if you look at what happens in this process, the, when you make a conceptual leap, that leap actually changes the entire innovation cycle as a founder. Um, and with that in mind, what I'd like to talk about is, as we see these devices coming out, what's the big leap that has occurred? So we can then envision what products will be formed, uh, what clusters of things will work, where do you focus on to create the biggest cycle of innovation? And with that in mind, let me bring you to the now and talk about where we see the world today coming from this background. Okay? So the thing, if I take a step back, the biggest thing in the digital 3.0 model is the convergence of content, e-commerce or commerce, community, which is social networking, communication, which is things like WhatsApp, Line and Tango, 
and context, which is by channel or by category, finding things. So this includes both content and applications, okay? Now, one of the things we learned at Apple in the 10 years I was there was we never confuse convergence with both things become one. So what that means is, as a, as a simple example, when Tango adds content to its communication app, it still leaves its heart and center in communication. Make sense? Because if it doesn't keep its core purpose, messaging, all the other things will not work. Take Facebook, for example. It actually stripped out communication from its core product, right? That's a very big decision to make. So you have two different products now, one Facebook for feed and one for communication. Now, Facebook made a very big leap about four months ago. Four months ago, Facebook made the decision in its mobile apps that content like video will no longer be linked out. So in these circles, uh, community or social networking was a form of discovery for content elsewhere. Everyone agrees? For Twitter, Pinterest, Facebook, we go to these apps to discover content, and we want to read all of it, we go to the site or the app, wherever the content came from. Facebook, about four months ago, turned on autoplay in video. Uh, this simple move, which doesn't look very big in mobile devices, completely transformed the playing field in the US in four months in the following way. Till summer, YouTube was number one, and there was no number two. Hulu was number two in video in the US. Uh, and within Facebook, 70% of all videos were YouTube videos, okay? By December, YouTube had fallen inside uh, Facebook to less than 10% of videos, and Facebook video had become 60%. Why is this important? In four months, Facebook has become number two, or sometimes number one in number of video views. The reason that's important is the people who control the top of the stack, which means closest to the consumer, usually control the most. So let me repeat that. The people that control the top of the stack in applications closest to the consumer will control the most and as a result will take most of the profits. That's right. So this is all about figuring out where on the stack you want to be. So if you look at very small things, very, very small, maybe very, very, very small things, uh, versus things, um, and you know the classification here, to phones and tablets, to bigger devices uh, like TV, all of these will have application builders, content creators, and platforms. The goal of today, rest of the presentation, is to really talk about, in specific, what types of content and apps will be built on these platforms, and what are the big, huge changes happening today in consumption which matter to you regardless of the size of the device. I'll give you three examples. The way we used to watch television was through a handheld remote control. Everyone agrees? In that remote control, we would find things based on prime time programming, where someone was programming what we should watch on TV, and also by the channel browse button. How many of you stumbled onto a channel you didn't ever want to watch and stayed and watched it? Maybe to animals running around, something you would never have read about earlier, but you just stumbled on it, agreed? So the discovery form of TV was the, was the channel browse button. If you look at the pre-Google, our discovery was through Yahoo. If you look at post-Google, we're doing search research, but that doesn't work for a lot of content or video or apps. How do you find apps today? Usually through someone who tells you about them because the fragmentation of apps is as big, if not bigger, than the fragmentation of content. So with that in mind, let's talk about things you can walk away with. Each of this is a major trend and change that will affect all applications and usage in all devices of all sizes. First, from 10 years ago to today, the change in time of a user, today over 50% is in a social feed. What that means is if you're building a mobile app or a device app or a thing app or a phone app or a TV app, your primary user interface has to be a social feed. If it's not in a feed, a consumer will not use it. Now, that's not easy to do. It's not easy to build. Most people don't have the layers to create a feed-based system. But if you're not a feed-based system, you simply will not get used over time. Very simple. 
Okay? Now, this is different than utility apps like Uber, where they don't have to be feed-based. They would be location-based. So if it's not feed-based, it would be location-based. But in a lot of cases, location will give you only a certain set of apps. All the other apps will be feed-based. Um, the second is social is the new distribution. If you don't understand that you have to have even the download of your app and the actual content, if you're producing content, has to be ultimately spread through social, you have not designed your, your philosophy of how you launch things. This is very, very difficult because usually, very late in your product launch cycle, you start thinking about spreading by social. You really have to start thinking about spreading by social when you're designing the product today. Very big change, okay? Feed and streams are the new consumption. This happened, as I said, less than four months ago. I would call this the single largest change in human usage in, the, in this decade that I have seen, which is no one believed that in a social feed you would start consuming content. It becomes a place to go to as opposed to a place to go from. What this means is, unlike a Google search model, which dominates most computing today, where the model is all about the speed of searching, leaving, and coming back, agreed? It's optimized to come back, so we become search researchers, right? It's not something human beings used to do before Google. That model is fundamentally under attack by Facebook today by saying you don't have to do search research. We will give you a feed based on in the initially who you follow. Now what Facebook is doing is they're programming our feed. So you will say, wait a minute, how can they program my feed? I'm only still saying, seeing things from people I follow. That's no longer true. The Facebook feed is no longer chronological by time. They are pushing stories that they believe either you should watch or pushing stories that they believe they want you to watch. Make sense? So if you suddenly start seeing there's three or four video stories in your feed in the first two pages, it's not because they're the most recent. That's because that's what Facebook believes, which is now moving into a consumption programming world. Fundamental change, that means the way applications and content was discovered will no longer be the same again. You have to live in this world, okay? The next one is there's a big myth which says great content always wins. Uh, we all come from this world of traditional media, which is a hits business. In the hits business, if you look at Disney, for example, if it, in a good year, it makes 20% of its income revenue from one movie. So if you look at the year uh, that Cars came out, it made $2.5 billion from the theatrical release of Cars. It made $8 billion from selling car toys, okay? Think about it, it's a $10 billion franchise was about 22% of their revenue that year, okay? And then the number two was 10%. After the first five or eight, the rest did not matter, okay? If you contrast that with YouTube or Mode or Facebook, it's completely reversed. Any company that was created post-social or post-apps is highly fragmented. In YouTube, the biggest mega star, even if you take the Gangnam style video, the channel represents less than 0.01% of YouTube in that year. It's really not, it's not a hits business. Even Michelle Fan, who might do 300 million views per video, represents less than 0.001% of YouTube. And every month and every year, her relative position versus all of YouTube declines forever, versus the star power of Brad Pitt increases every year, right? There's a fundamental shift that it's not that stars are, you know, not going to be there. There's going to be tens and thousands of stars, all very small, as opposed to big Madonnas in the future. That future is already here. Facebook is a hundred times more fragmented than YouTube. The biggest fan page on Facebook represents a very small part, which gives them tremendous market power. In mode, our biggest content creator, we deal with about 10,000 content creators. Uh, we're about twice as large as YouTube, but still very small compared to a you know, magazine company or a TV company. There are no hits. There's no hits because there's no distribution control, there's no magazines, there's not limited channels. Whenever you do that, hits will go away. So it's a fundamental new business. Um, I think I'll just skip that. The next thing is we believe you need cats to go viral. Everyone agrees? 
<laughs> well, let's, let's just say if you have cats or dogs or dolphins, maybe llamas last week if you were on the internet, it's generally clear that you will get viral. Um, however, it's not the only way things go viral. You know, actually, content that goes viral is viral because of the connectors that spread the content. It's word of mouth that makes things viral. And just like the Apple Watch or the Tesla is extremely viral, they don't have cats in their ads or in their cars, uh, people will repeat things for emotional reasons. And as a company, you have to understand that more than 50% of your marketing will have to be viral. So I'll tell you something we do as a company that is unbelievable. We don't use Google search at all. When we launch sometimes new channels, we would even turn Google search off completely in the beginning. Uh, and the reason is we don't have anything against Google. We love Google. It's a great company. We like to use search. But we want to build the other muscles of the body of the company as founders to say, how would you launch a product if you had zero dollars of marketing and zero dollars of search and zero dollars of app store promotion and zero dollars of promotion of your app downloads? What would you do? Well, most people don't know what to do. Um, and the reality is when you don't know what to do, you have to learn to innovate. This thing, which is how do you go viral, has to be in your DNA from the beginning as you go forward. This is the battlefield of the future of all products and apps, okay? And influencers are really important, understanding how influencers work to spread information, content, and knowledge is very, very, very important. So you have to have what I call the soju, which is the social juice. Uh, this is what drives things as ideas forward. We all know about the big shift to the new generation, and I think I would kind of end this part by really talking about the emotion and science about how media works is really about how people you know, do things, which is why people create things, either as user-generated content or professional, what they curate, what, what, what do you like or love on Facebook, says a lot about you, agreed, or your friends. Where they consume, what device, at what time, in bed with iPad or at a distance or on TV, and how they share. What things do you put on Twitter versus Facebook versus LinkedIn versus Mode are very different parts. So with that in my last few minutes, as we always say at Apple, just one more thing. I'm not going to do a keynote without giving you a sneak peek at a product that's not been released. And that's what I'm going to do in the next two minutes, which is where Mode is right now very quickly is where we reach about 400 million consumers. Um, today's a very big day for us because if you look on the right, that is U.S. numbers. We reach, we're number seven in the U.S. in desktop. This month, for the first time, our mobile reach exceeded our desktop reach. So we're now number eight in mobile in the U.S. with 93 million consumers a month. Just think about that. Um, we have created a team from Apple and other places to create products and platforms for this audience. Um, in the way we work is every device is different, and the usage of every device will be different, and therefore the apps designed for every device will be different. The back, everything else is a platform based on cloud services. We acquired Ning from Mark Andreessen about three years ago. Everything we've done is built on the Ning platform, so we're able to create applications specifically for a new device, even before it was envisioned, because the APIs uh, have been thought through by us for the future. And this gives you an idea of the top 100 companies in the US and how the growth has been. Google was the first one. It's usually Yahoo, AOL at the top in the past. Then became Facebook, and then YouTube, and then that's mode. So you can see the power of platforms and working with creators, how fast you can create a top seven media company, and in our case, a private media company, okay? Um, the three things we do is deliver ads. We cr have people who create content and apps for us. And we distribute, actually, uh, content inside feeds. So we operate one of the largest feed-based content distribution outside of Facebook today in the world. Um, and uh, really, the whole idea is how we can harness this power uh, off that. So with that in mind, um, I have a little preview to give you all. Um, today, uh, we have a beta version of our next platform that is available uh, in beta for you to all try. 
Um, it's called Mode Platform. You can go to beta.mode.com on any mobile device. What it is is a feed-based system in which content is curated by journalists, editors, and creators. So the best content of the web, which is created by people who are professional, can be actually curated for people. So big differences in Facebook, you see what your friends and UGC content puts on Facebook. Our goal was to go out and curate the web. How big is that goal? We believe about 20% to 25% of all the content on the web is professional. The rest is UGC or you know, people who are gaming you or bots, et cetera. So our goal is to go out by every category and have people who are professional. We have about 10,000 of those who work with us today. Our goal is we'll have about 100,000 editors, writers, creators on this platform that bring everything you like. So what is this? Each of this is a story, almost like Beats did for music, which was a playlist created by professionals. We've created a platform that allows you to create a story of all the things you love on the web uh, based on simple one click. So, you know, Pinterest on steroids, but formatted. And also what we're building, of course, is a native app uh, that will be coming soon, uh, given Apple's process of approval. Uh, and this will be a place you can go to to really see a feed of content that you n already know there's a level of human being that has actually touched it and said, you know, this is worth reading. Uh, this answers a big question we think consumers, all of us have, which is, you know, when we want actually to be entertained or engage or find content, uh, the stated need to start with the Apple metaphor is, for example, I want to find a sushi restaurant near me right now. Everyone agrees that's a stated need. The unstated need is I want to find a sushi restaurant near me right now based on someone who knows about sushi. Thank you very much. Please try it. <laughs>